As I said, we're starting this new message series called Going Next Level. And really what we'll be doing is looking at the early Christian church in the book of Acts and how it applies to us. So that's what this series is about. And I wanna put up the graphic for the series, if we could do that, which is uh, Going Next Level. Let's see if we can get that graphic up here. I'll, I, I kind of surprised them on this, but. Um, all right, so we can kind of see it there. So on the corner to the left, the subtitle of this series is The Ripple Effect of the Gospel. And you're all familiar with a ripple effect if you've ever thrown a stone into a little pool of water, right? So that splash causes a ripple, and it goes further and further and gets bigger and bigger caused by that splash. Well, that also happens with events in our life, right? Can you think of a recent event or event in the past that has had huge ripple effects in your own life? And sometimes that's a mixture of good and bad, isn't it? I know for me, I think of um, the birth of our three kids. Each one, a ripple effect of both extreme joy and extreme challenge at the same time. So when we talk about ripple effect and what causes that, what we're looking at in this series is that for the history of the world and for your own heart, nothing has caused a greater splash and ripple effect than the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his gospel message. Even non-unbelieving historians would say Christ and his followers cause a disruption in the world unlike anything that's ever been seen. And so here's the first fill-in that um, we wanna talk about in this whole series. Going next level, here's what we mean, that the gospel has a ripple effect in my own heart and in the world. And that's what the book of Acts shows us. And that's why it's so cool to read into it. Now, here's also what I like to say with ripple effect. It's really saying that God's gospel is never done with you. The gospel of Jesus, and it's never done in our world. That's the comforting thing and the challenging thing we'll see in this series. But today, what we get to do is we get to dive into, on the title here, you see, next level discipleship, okay? That's a churchy word, all right? You don't hear a ton of people saying the word discipleship outside of the church. And you see the word disciple in that, right? Disciple means a follower of Christ. So we're talking about following Christ and what a, what a great Sunday to do that when we have uh, some young people who are saying, I wanna follow Christ the rest of my life. And also, as you saw in the insert, many adults who have made that commitment as well and know Christ's love. So we talk about being a follower of Christ, but that word discipleship is sometimes a little confusing because sometimes people think when it comes to being a disciple of Christ that what it's really about, it's all about knowledge. And some of you confirmands might think, yeah, I had to take a, a 85 point test, uh, test, 72 questions. It's a lot about knowledge, Phil. <laughs> knowledge is part of it, but it's not the heart of what discipleship is. You might think that um, some people think being a follower of Christ is all about obedience, that I, I just need to obey everything that God tells me to do. And obedience is part of being a follower of Christ, but it's not the heart of it. It's not what's gonna cause the ripple effect in your own heart. And here I want you to write something down. It's not a filling in your notes, but it's very important. This is, is how we define discipleship at Crosswalk is what we feel God's word says. Are you ready for it? So write the word discipleship. Discipleship equals growing into a mature reliance on God. So write that down, growing into a mature reliance on God. Do you see the irony in that definition? Mature reliance? Often, what do we think of maturity as? 
being self-reliant. Mom doesn't have to wake me up for school anymore. I study for my own test. I get my own job. I move out of the house. I, 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 it's all about self-reliance. And obviously, you parents know that's something we wanna teach our kids, to be independent. However, in God's world, when it comes to what God's most concerned about, he flips that. And he says that true maturity is every day relying on your faith in Christ and his love more and more and more. And you see that in our text for today, unlike anything else. So that's what we mean by discipleship. And so you see, knowledge can be a part of that. Because if I'm going to rely on Christ, I want to know what he says. Obedience can be a part of that. When I'm filling up with his love, I want to follow him. I want to rely on him. But reliance on Christ and trust in him, and less and less on yourself, is really what discipleship is all about. So can you see the lifelong process of that? Because we're taught so often to rely on yourself, be independent, and God really says, let go of your life more and more and give it to me. All right, so that's the setup. Now let's get into these verses in the book of Acts and talk about a splash that makes a ripple effect. This, now we're shaking things up here. And we're talking about Saul, who's also known as Paul. Now, Saul is the way you say his Hebrew name. Paul is the way you say his Roman name. It's, it's the same person. And that was common back in the day to kind of have two ways to say your name, right? So if you hear me say Saul or Paul, it's, I, I can't, I don't know. I'll, it's the same person, okay? So, so give me a little break there. Saul and Paul. So I'll probably use Saul a lot because we get, uh, you'll see where we're at in his life. And this is uh, happening right a little bit after Jesus ascends into heaven and when the early Christian church is just getting going. So here we go, hang on. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. So Saul was a very wise, a very intelligent religious leader of the, in the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee. He was uh, an Israelite. And he was also very passionate about stomping out what was called the way, what we know as Christianity. And so he's on his way to uh, arrest Christians, and he thought that he was honoring God by doing this, thought he was doing the right thing. And suddenly, as you saw in the verses, there was a bright light from heaven, and he hears this voice that says, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the voice is Jesus, the one that Saul is against. This was not what Saul had in mind when he was on his way to Damascus. He left confident. He left with a passion to do this. He left knowing this was the right thing on his way to Damascus. And now he is going to Damascus, but he's going there blind, being led by his companions, and now kind of confronting this thought of, oh my goodness, Jesus might be the real thing. Not what Paul had in mind when he met Christ. And a lot of times when we meet Christ in his word, our lives don't always go as we have in mind either. And so here we have Paul 
going to Damascus. But, and here's what I want you to, to see, though, and, and we'll see this um, in today's message. Saul thought that at first it was just about Jesus physically blinding him. But really what Jesus was doing here was letting Paul know that he was already blind. Not physically, but blind spiritually. And Saul even admits this later on when he writes uh, these verses. I'm gonna show you these verses, they're not in your notes, but, but look at this when we talk about blindness. Look at what Saul writes, and he's talking first about himself and then about others. Here's what he says. The God of this age has blinded, not the eyes, blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is Paul writing this, probably hearkening back to when he was blinded by Christ. And what he's saying there is he's talking about himself first, but he's talking about unbelievers and really how all of us start out is we start out spiritually blind to the glory of Christ. We, we don't start out in this life naturally seeking God. We start out seeking self. We start out seeking our own self-reliance. And that's what Paul was trying to get to the, to the heart of, that when it comes to next level discipleship, relying on God, we all start the same, and it's a tough situation, being spiritually blind. We can't do this on our own. And here's, here's what, I, what I know, and I, I think you know this too, is when we talk about self-reliance and spiritual blindness, they, they go together, and, but it, it comes out in various ways. Um, and we can see this in ourselves and, and in the world. Self-reliance can come out as, as something that looks very good. It can come off as looking as, as really dedicating your life to a cause. We, we see that in our world today. Lots of causes, some of them good causes, that can take the center of someone's life and Christ just becomes an afterthought or it's even against Christ but it can appear to, to have a lot of good in life. Self-reliance can come off as really going after success. You confirmands going into high school, you wanna succeed. Don't make your success put a shadow on Christ and your reliance on him. And then on the other, and so that was kind of like Paul. Paul was in that boat where he was very confident uh, probably someone that was a leader even before he met Christ. But then let's go to the opposite of, of Paul. And sometimes we don't think of this as self-reliance, but this is, this is a lot of times where I fall into. Self-reliance can often come off as if you're very, very sensitive to criticism. It can also come off if you just can't handle when someone says something bad about you. It can also show where that even drives you to feeling hopeless. Now, you might say, Phil, that's not self-reliance. You got to, you, you know, buck it up in those situations. But what that's showing us is that self-reliance isn't just about do I have the power in life, but it's really saying what do I rely on myself for? And if you rely on yourself for your worth, for your value, that I'm going to create my own worth and value, then you're gonna end up disappointed. Then that shows our spiritual blindness, right? Now, um, one last thing on this that I wanna say is that what's difficult about this is that our world, our culture, preaches self-reliance. Our world, our culture says, says no, you have to rely on you and, and you can create exactly what you want. And it's kind of funny, when I'm, I was driving down the, uh, the freeway the other day, and uh, let's see if you can fill in the blank, those of you who drive on the freeways. There's these billboards for uh, several casinos, right? And there's a guy kind of like dressed up, right? And uh, on, on the billboard is three words, all right? I'm gonna start and you finish. Here we go. You, oh my goodness, you're, you're disciples of the self-reliance theory. Very, very good. And here's, 
Here's why I say that that's, that's a message of self-reliance. Is that, that message is you get to rely on yourself for, for what you determine right and wrong is. That, do, do whatever feels good. And also, you do you is you are the one that's gonna create your own happiness in this life, and you better rely on yourself. So we are, we are getting this message in our culture all the time. Be self-reliant in everything. And Paul was confronted with this. Now, here's, here's the deal is we, when it comes to next level discipleship, we all have kind of a Saul moment. It's probably not as dramatic as this, but we have a, a moment where Christ does confront us in, in his word. And, and it could be through a difficult situation in our life. Who knows? But he, he works in his word. And, and let me give you the next fill in here. Is that next level discipleship starts with being lovingly confronted by Christ about my spiritual blindness and self-reliance. And notice I say lovingly because who's gonna raise their hand and say, I love being confronted about my spiritual blindness. It is a painful thing. But it's a necessary thing because then Christ can do his work of filling our hearts up with grace. And now here, here's what a message I wanna say to you confirmands and to everyone else too. I used to think that admitting my sins, confessing my sins to God was something I had to do. And now, I really, it's something I get to do. It's still painful, but man, in the mornings when I have my time with God, I get to say, God, here's where I think I'm, I'm blind. And here's where some Christian friends have helped, helped me see where I'm blind. Here's where I'm relying on myself. It's something now I get to give to him because that's what, that's what Christ ultimately wants is every day to us rely on him more and more. So, so Christ reliance, it starts with, are we willing to every day say, God, here's how I need you. Here's how I'm apart from you. To start there. All right, I wanna say this. Um, I love it that if you saw, saw in the verses that Christianity was referred to as the way, did you see that in these verses that, that Paul was trying to stomp out the way? And I love that it's referred to as the way. Here's why. Because so often Christianity is thought of as the wall. And a wall is something that if you wanna get over it, you have to climb. And so it's often thought of that to be a really good Christian, I am gonna climb this wall and I am going to get more knowledge and obey God more. And I'm gonna get so high up on this wall. But then what happens is that if we mess up, we have a sinful nature. What can happen? We have a term for this, is if someone messes up royally, what do we say? A fall from grace. A fall from grace. That is absolutely not how the Bible communicates it. That, that Christianity, that following Christ is I've something I've got to advance and climb on. And then if I fall, because if you think of it that way, when you do sin and mess up, where do you think you have to start from? The bottom. And guilt and shame will just weigh on you. And you'll feel like, I can never go back to following Christ. I can never go back to to that. And, and some of you might say, I don't even want to start. I don't even want to start with this, the way thing be, or the Christianity thing, because I don't want to climb and fall. That hurts. But viewing it as the way, as a path, changes everything. Because a path is something that you're, you're, you're either on or off. And if you get off the path, guess what you can do? Turn around and get back on it. And what I'm, what I'm saying here is that that is talking about faith that the Holy Spirit puts in us is getting on the path. It's all by his power. And if we turn our backs on God, if we sin, if we go away from him, what repentance is, is simply saying, God, I'm wandering off the path. I want to get back on it, trusting you. And guess what? We get back right on the, on the path and we're right back where we started. 
We're not down at the bottom because the path is about relying on Christ. So it's not so much about how far down or back are you on the path, but simply that you're on it because that means Christ has a hold of your heart. So then shame and guilt, you can say, listen, I, t- I turned away from that. I turn away from that sh- shame and guilt because I'm on the secure path with Christ. That's why I love that it's called the way. And there's no better example of Christianity being the way rather than the wall than with Saul. Let's keep reading. Let's look at the next verses. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. In this room, I'm guessing everyone is on a different place in that path on the way. Maybe some of you are saying, I, I, I'm not on that path. I don't necessarily want to rely on Christ. And maybe some of you are still thinking of it as the wall, and you're like, oh, man, I so royally messed up. Maybe some of you think, I'm pretty far down the path. What I love is that in these verses, we see that God always has an opportunity to take you on your next step down the path or on the path of relying on him. Because we see Saul here, and what was Saul, Saul's next step right here? It wasn't really to do anything. It was really to stop doing what he was doing. And it says that he was simply was praying. And what that really meant is he, he was so confused, I bet. Oh my goodness, what's going on here? And, and really his act of prayer was an act of reliance right there, saying, God, I, I don't know what's going on, but I had... You came and, and met me. And now he had to, to, to deal with that. And so maybe your next step, maybe what your next step opportunity is, is to cry out to God. <laughs> Say, God, I don't know what's going on in my life. I, I need you. And you'll have, you'll have those moments. Maybe, maybe your next step is, is to admit, maybe I've never admitted that, that I have spiritual blindness. Maybe your next step is like with Ananias because Ananias was in a little different spot here. Ananias was a disciple of Christ. He, he knew Christ. He, he was a leader, right? And Ananias' next step was to face a fear. And this was a huge fear. Uh, you want me to go talk to who? To... To Saul, he was like the most anti-Christian person you could meet. I'm gonna go, and he's praying? Are you kidding me? God, I think you got this one wrong here, okay? And so we see that that, um, maybe that's you. Is is there a a fear in your life? And and it's a fear of, I don't know if I can really rely on God with this. And, and And I understand, I have some fears of those. Can I really give this to Christ? Can I really trust in him? All right. Here's some advice. Before you leave here today, just just some advice. I want you to think about what your next step is on the path of relying on Christ. Maybe it's even that you, you just challenge your current way of thinking. If you're like, no, this isn't for me, maybe your next step is just to challenge your yourself. Doubt your own doubts. That's all I ask. Or maybe your next step is what fear do I need to face? So ask yourself that before you leave today. All right, now let's keep going on the verses here. Acts 9, 15 to 16. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. 
I wanna talk about verse 15 first, and then we'll get back to 16. But I, I hope that you see in verse 15 the absolute life-changing thing that happens here and the ripple effect unlike any other. Here was Saul, the enemy of Christ, and now Jesus is saying, I'm gonna use him to make a huge impact in the world. And here's the impact. The fact that we are here today and that millions of people worship Christ today is largely, very largely, because of the work Christ did in Saul, in one man. There's no joke on that. From one man, we see how God changes one heart and he can change the world, literally, if you look into Saul. That's the amazing grace and message of, of this. And, and Saul knew this. Look at what Saul writes later in his life. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 16. I love this, these verses. Here's what Saul writes later. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Here's the next fill-in I want you to put. God's grace goes beyond all levels. It can transform any heart. It can empower any person to make a life-changing impact. We see in what Saul says here, God's grace in two angles. And the first angle is for any of you that say, there's no way that that God can love me because of what I've done. done. I'm worthless, I have so much shame, I have so much guilt. And here's what Paul says, if Christ can save me, he can save anyone. Because it's the transforming love and grace that he has. So don't let your guilt, don't let your shame come creeping up. Paul says, if he, if he forgave me, he can forgive you. If he can use me, he can use you. Because the truth is, it's a miracle that any of us are here believing in Christ, as we talked about later, because of spiritual blindness. It's all by his grace and his power. So don't ever let yourself think, no, I, God can't love me after what I've done. It's about his grace and his, his mercy, right? And, and that transforms then the impact that you can make in this world. Because let me say this, if, you're, if you struggle with guilt, you often feel like you can't make a huge impact in this world. And I'm gonna say this, because of Christ, your impact in this world is not chained by your guilt, it's unleashed by God's grace. It's not chained by your guilt, it's unleashed by God's grace, and no better example than with Saul. I wanna talk about the second angle of God's grace in this. And this is for those of us, those of you, who think that, you know, Christianity is more like the wall, uh, where, you know, it kind of is about uh, my talents and my abilities and climbing higher. And really, to, to be a good Christian, I, um, I need to look at how, how well I'm using my gifts and how much I'm accomplishing for Christ. And I'm gonna look just at the results, okay? And I'm not saying that results aren't important, but here's what I am gonna say. Saul had you beat on that already before he met Christ. Saul knew more than you of God's word. He probably behaved better than you. Um, he lived his life to honor God. He was wiser and smarter than you. He, he, he says this, if we wanna compare uh, resumes, Saul had us all beat. And this, this didn't matter to Christ. Christ said, listen, Saul, why do you persecute me? Change your ways, right? And, and, and the grace in this is, 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 is this. So I, I wanna read some verses Paul writes later in 1 Corinthians. You probably have heard these at a wedding. And it's gonna change the way you think of them. Here's, here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the prophet, gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, 
And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. You see, what Paul is saying is, he's not saying that gifts and talents are bad, no. But what he's saying is, first of all, if you base your life on how well you use your talents or you base your life on your accomplishments, know this, first of all, if they're not done out of love for Christ, they mean nothing. And second of all, you'll be miserable because guess what? When it comes to talents and abilities, those are limited And there's always someone that's gonna be better than you and more successful than you, so you'll never feel like you're truly making an impact. You'll be comparing yourself, right? And so there's grace for those of us who struggle with this. Paul's saying that don't think your impact on the world is based on your ability or accomplishments. Here's what Paul's saying to make your goal. How about instead of saying my goal is to do all these great accomplishments and and, become the most talented person, What if you made actually a realistic goal, which doesn't seem realistic, but here it is. What if you set out to be the most grace-filled, loving, forgiving person that you know? You wanna talk about the impact that you'll make? And that's because you can only be the most loving, grace-filled, forgiving person by being reliant on Christ, that's the only way. And guess what? His resources are limitless. He will give you more grace than you can imagine. He will give you more forgiveness than you can imagine. He will give you more love than you can imagine, and that will flow out of you and watch the impact. That's how Saul made the impact. And then he was using his gifts for the right purpose, and he was accomplishing things for the glory of Christ. All right, here's what I want to put on the screen right now. Kind of winding down the message, but I I, I want to put this on here. This is an excerpt from one of our confirmands that put on their final paper. So let's see if we can get that up here. She ended her paper with this. I am a dearly beloved child of God bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. That is a statement of someone who's going to make an impact. Notice that it's not, here's what I'm going to do for God. It's here's what Jesus has done for me and all my goodness. It's kind of like, watch out because God's grace will overflow. That's my prayer for, for, for myself, for all of you. Have this be seared in your brain. Okay. Now let's look um, at Acts 9.16 where um, Saul says, or, or God says, I'm going to show Saul how much he's going to suffer for my name. <laughs> like, oh, great, we get to end with suffering. Thanks, Phil. But a Christian life of following Christ, discipleship, you have to talk about suffering because Jesus does. Jesus, yes, says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, I will give you rest. So being a Christ follower, the most immense peace and rest you will have And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, daily deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Pick up your cross, something Jesus died on. And so what he's saying about suffering is that the Christian life is brutal. The Christian life is brutal. We talked about the beauty part, right? The peace and joy And at the same time, it's brutal because you're signing up for an epic spiritual battle all the time. And and the why is when you say, Christ, I, I, I love you because you loved me first, Satan becomes your enemy even more. Number two, you have a world of people, a lot of people who don't like the message of Christ. And three, you've got this thing called a sinful nature still that doesn't go away. And so that's that what causes the suffering. And what does it look like? What does suffering for Christ look like? I used to think it was like, you know, if my AC in my car goes out, that's suffering. Ah, suffering for Christ. Well, in Arizona, it might be. <laughs> but a lot of times, it, you'll, you'll know it. it it's, it's ridicule. It's, it could be sleepless nights. It could just be spiritual turmoil. It could be being misunderstood. 
And, and so Christ wants you to be honest about that. So in this brutal life, here's where we're gonna end up. Because, you know, what if I just said, amen, okay, amen, it's a brutal life, go, go out. But some days feel like that. Some days feel like, you know, you will suffer for me, go to sleep, amen, and then wake up tomorrow. They do feel that way sometimes. But I wanna read these last verses because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't end just there. So here's what, here's what the last verses are, Acts 9, 17 and 19. It says, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. You are not alone on this journey. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit caused Paul to see. He will cause you to see. Saul was, was baptized and he received the blessings of forgiveness, new life, and the promise of salvation. Through faith, you receive that same thing. We are not also alone because we have the Holy Spirit, but look at what Ananias calls Saul. Calls his former enemy. What does he say? Brother. When you're a disciple of Christ, you have a family of believers. And, and we don't use that term loosely. It's a real thing, a family of believers, right? And I wanna say this, I wanna end with this. We all need an Ananias and we all need a Saul in our life. And here's what I mean. We need an Ananias, someone who's gonna pour into us and look out for us and be there for us like he was to Saul, and we all need a Saul. Who are we pouring into? Who are we leading to Christ? Who are we loving? So many things at Crosswalk are built on this. Our growth groups are built on this, that in a growth group, look for an Ananias, someone that you can learn from, pour your heart out to, look for a Saul, someone that you can build up, someone that you can reach out to. It's our youth ministry. It's why we have youth mentors who pour into kids. And, and my job really isn't to directly pour into the students, it's to pour into those adults. And then I need people to look up to as well and be my Ananias. So that's the other thing is, Look around for who's your Ananias. Who's for someone that, that you, you can be fed with the love of Christ? The people that have most made the impact in my life aren't people with the greatest talents or accomplishments. It, it's people that were filled with the love of Christ that have changed my life and that poured themselves into me. You are not alone, confirmants. You are not alone, family, friends, people who are here listening to God's word. And here's how I want to end today. With the last fill-in, with the Holy Spirit leading us, we can take this gospel message out together as Christ's family. And I don't know if there's a line for together, but just write together somewhere, because that's important. As the ripple effect of the gospel goes out into the world, we get to do this together, church family. Congratulations to you guys. May God bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending your son for us. We thank you so much for what you did for Saul and what you do for us. And you, you change the way we see. You confront us lovingly. You fill us with your grace and your mercy and you put us on the way the way to eternal life through your son, Jesus, and it's through trust. Lord, I ask you to bless these young people today, bless the, the adults as well, that we stay close to you by relying on you, and, and Lord, we know the impact you can make through us by the power of your Holy Spirit. So please, Lord, take us to the next level. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.